thing, Sergeant Klein. What do you mean you were robbed? Held up? So where did this happen? Where? Did he have a gun? There were two men. When was this? Just now? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. That's where they went. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Where are you calling from? Where? On what floor is that? All right. You take the elevator back downstairs. The officers will be right there. They'll be right there. You just wait. Yes, ma'am. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. What makes a city? Not buildings, not subways, not business. People make a city. From dawn to midnight, from midnight to dawn, the rich and the poor and the good and the bad pour their lives together and stir up the city. As in the 21st, sometime in a way you'd least expect. I was working my 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. tour. It had started to rain during the night, and it was still raining at 1.15 p.m. when I came out of the luncheon meeting of the Lenox Hill Lions Club, at which I spoke on the problems of juvenile delinquency. From the lobby of the hotel, I rang in. Sergeant Klein on T.S. told me everything was quiet. I instructed him to send a car for me. When it came, I had the operator, Patrolman Farrell, drive me to the New Era Theater, a movie house on First Avenue. I went into the lobby and was told by the manager that uh, Mr. Crows could be found at the back of the theater near the candy stand. I saw him in the dim light, and I walked over. A cartoon was on the screen. Hello, Mr. Crows, huh? Oh, Captain, how are you? Just fine. I uh, had a report from Sergeant Collins on the night tour that you've been having some trouble over this way. Yeah, that's right, Captain, but I told the sergeant what was on my mind last night. I appreciate you stopping by anyway. Well, I'm giving instructions to the men on post and in the cars here to pay special attention to the conditions. Oh, well, thanks. Oh, just a second. Here's that scene. I get the biggest kick out of these cartoons. I don't know why. <laughs> you ever seen anything so funny? Well, it's sure clever, all right. Mm. Look in there, Captain. A rainy afternoon and business is just fine. You know, I got the answer to what's wrong with the picture business. Have you? Mm-hmm. If they make a good picture, you do business. Even on a day like this. It's simple. Make all good pictures. Uh, how many kids, as a rule, hang out at that candy store at night, Mr. Cross? Well, you know, it varies. Now, on a nice night or a Saturday, there's a whole gang of them. They yell and they make jokes at the people coming on their way to the theater at night. And that can scare them. I don't need my patrons scared away. Condition at the box office is bad enough, and it's not healthy for the neighborhood. All right, Mr. Cross. We'll see what we can do about it. Look at that rabbit. <laughs> How do you like that? You know, I see a feature picture once, I'm through with it, but I can watch these cartoons four or five times a day. Yeah, well, if the condition doesn't clear up, Mr. Cross, you just get in touch with me. Oh, uh, is this the cop looking for you, Captain? Oh, yeah. Excuse me, Captain. Yes, Farrell? Uh, signal 30 just came over. Yeah? Hold up just around the corner at 340. I thought you might want to take a look. Yes, I do. So long, Mr. Cross. Uh, thanks, Captain. One man, no description put out yet. All right. Let's go. I left the theater with Patrolman Farrell. It was still raining. We got into the car, and he drove around the corner to 340, a loft building. The sector car and the sergeant's car were already there. <coughs> sergeant Burns had posted his operator at the front door of the building to keep the curious out of the lobby. He held the door open and nodded as I went in. The lobby was long and narrow, the building old and grimy. At the far end of the lobby was a single old-fashioned elevator. Sergeant Burns was talking to a woman dressed in a raincoat, a woman about 35. The sector man and the patrolman on post were questioning the elevator operator several feet away. I walked to Sergeant Burns. Do you know how much was in the envelope exactly? Hello, Sergeant. Well, Captain. there was $1,362.25. Exactly? Yes. How did you know that? I just came from the bank. It was the payroll. Oh. 
Captain Canelli, this is Miss Beatrice Parazoni. How do you do? Is that how you pronounce it, Parazoni? Yes, that's right. She's a bookkeeper for a firm up on the sixth floor, Captain. Mm-hmm. She's coming back from the bank with a payroll. Man followed her into the lobby and onto the elevator, pulled a gun, took the package. Then he forced the elevator operator to take them back down to the ground level. He got off, told him to go straight up to the top. Is that about right, uh, Mr. President? Yes, that's right, exactly. Did you uh, get a description, Sergeant? Yes, sir, as good as they could give me. I didn't remember much. I honestly didn't. I could only look at that gun. That's all I could see. The elevator operator is not so good with the English. Mm. I called to yes, gave him the best description we could get. Good. Uh, what kind of company is it you work for? Well, it's a place that makes optical lenses, you know, for eyeglasses. Yeah. It's just a small company, about 14, 15 men working in the shop and myself in the office with the boss. That's all. That was the whole payroll, $1,362.25, the whole payroll for a week. Where's your boss? Did you tell him about it? I stopped up on the floor to call the police. He's not there. He's out selling. He's usually in the shop in the morning. He goes out seeing customers in the afternoon. How long have you been employed there, Mr. Parazoni? Oh, almost 10 years, between 9 and 10. You uh, never had anything like this happen before, did you? Oh, no, nothing like this at all, never. Well, it's five minutes after three now, Miss Parazoni. Uh, what time did you leave the office for the bank? Well, it was just about 2 o'clock on payday. I usually work all morning until I get the payroll finished, and then I write out the check, and the boss signs it before he leaves to call on customers. Uh-huh. I had the check, and I went out to lunch. And then I was going to the bank right before it closed to come back here in time to make up the payroll for when the men go home. You uh, follow this pattern pretty much every week? What do you mean? Well, I mean, do you pay on the same day every week? Oh, yeah. And uh, do you go to the bank just about the same time? Yes, they're usually right before it closes. Oh, Sergeant, you ought to have the sector car get back on patrol. We don't need them here anymore. Yes, sir, Captain. All right, Ryan, Thomas. I Super really patrol. ought to be getting upstairs and back to work, Captain. I don't know what I'm going to do about the payroll today. I don't know where I can reach the boss and the bank is closed. It'll be a shame for the men to go home without their money. Can I go upstairs now and see if I can get it straightened out? Well, the detectives will be here any minute, Miss Parazoni. They'll want to talk to you. I think you ought to wait down here until they come. Hello. Uh, ring in when you get back in service. I don't see what I have to wait for the detectives for. I told you everything I know. I told you and that sergeant and the police in there. Yes, well, it's the detective's case. It's up to them to conduct the investigation. I see. Out of all people, Captain, I don't know. Why did they pick on me? The funny thing he picked on me. Is it? <laughs> I guess he didn't pick on me. He just picked on the $1,300. The essential duty of the uniformed force is patrol. When the criminal is unknown or has fled, it is the job of the detectives to investigate. In this, as in all similar cases, the 21st Detective Squad under the command of Lieutenant Matt King was notified by the desk officer immediately on receipt of the report. Within a few minutes, Detectives Ben Novak and Whitey Howard were on the job. Sergeant Burns opened his memorandum book, and from notes he had taken for his UF-61 and unusual occurrence report, gave them the facts as he had learned them. He introduced them to the victim and to the witness, then resumed patrol. I returned to the precinct house. It was still raining, but not nearly so hard. I walked to the telephone switchboard where Sergeant Klein was on the boxes. Hello, Captain. Any messages, Sergeant? No telephone messages, no, sir. But there was a communication on the teletype addressed to all precinct division and borough commanders. I put it on your desk. Good. Tell Glass I'll read and sign whatever report he's got ready now. Yes, sir. I'm in my office. Yes. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Captain Kelly. Hello. All right, 24. Oh, hello, Mr. Cross. Captain, uh, can I uh, talk to you for a minute? What's the matter? Are those boys at the candy store giving you trouble this early in the day? No, no, I'd, uh, I'd just like to talk to you, Captain, if I could. Yeah, sure. Come into my office. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Ah, have a seat, Mr. Crowe. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, what's on your mind? Well, uh, Captain, uh, I'm a curious type, you know. Like anybody else, I like a little excitement. So on. When that cop came in and told you there was a Signal 30 around the corner, I got sort of interested. It's no secret what a Signal 30 is. It's an armed felony, right? That's right. Well, anyway, I figured I'd like to see what's going on. So when you left, I got my raincoat, and I walked around the corner. The cop was standing at the door of the loft building, so I couldn't get in. But I looked through the door, and I saw that girl you were talking to. And from the conversation around there, I found out that she was held up for a payroll. Right? Yeah, that's right. What about it? Well, uh, look, it's... it's None of my business, maybe. I, I feel 
feel like an idiot. Well, you came here to tell me, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I did. That girl, Captain, the, the one that was held up, she did an awful funny thing a little while before. Well, what do you mean? About 2 o'clock, I was standing in the lobby there, in the lobby of the theater. It was raining outside, and I was still wondering how we were doing all the business we were doing so early in the day with the weather. But a good picture will bring him in. That's all you need. Uh, what about the girl? Yeah, well, I guess it was about 2 o'clock. I remember it because she had on a funny brown raincoat with a plaid pattern. You know, the one she was wearing. Yeah. Well, she bought a ticket, and she came in a theater. Did she? Yeah, she did. Now, I know that's not funny in itself. I wouldn't have noticed her except for that raincoat. But I stand in the lobby a few minutes, talk to the ticket taker, go to the box office, talk to the cashier, shake hands with a few patrons. Mm-hmm. Then it's about 2.10, maybe 2.15, and I see this raincoat walking out again. Well, I figure this is funny. So I stop her in the lobby, and I say, what's the matter, lady? Did you see the picture before? If you saw the picture before, I'd be glad to give you your money back. We don't want any dissatisfied patrons. Now, what'd she say? She said, no, she didn't see the picture before. Uh-huh. So I told her, look, lady, if it's not the kind of picture you think it is, or you don't like it, let me give you a free pass. You can come back some other time. You know, we, we do these things for public relations. But she says, no, everything is all right. She doesn't want her money back or anything like that. Anyways, while I'm standing there talking to her, a man walks out of the theater, and he walks right past without saying a word. Well, she sort of looks at him like she was going to say something, like she knows him, but he walked out, and he didn't even turn to her. Yes? Yeah. Well, that's all. Is it? Yeah, except that she left. <clears throat> well, I see I shouldn't... But in anybody else's business. Uh, uh, sit down, Mr. Claus. You think there's something to it, Captain? I thought there was something to it. That's why I came over here, but I can't figure out what. What did the man look like? Well, that, that's kind of hard to say. Well, was he tall? Oh, I couldn't say he was exactly tall, but I couldn't say short either. Medium, maybe. You sure it was the same girl? I'm positive. I never forget a face, and I never forget a raincoat. In the whole city of New York, there couldn't be two raincoats like that, at least in this neighborhood. Listen, Captain, you think there's something to it? You think I hit on something? Maybe. For what? What? Mr. Crows, it's just like in your business. They're not all good pictures. Some of them we have to clear up. The inconsistency of witnesses and their honest mistakes are major problems to law enforcement officers. The whole truth is not an easy thing at which to arrive. In this case, the victim of the robbery, Miss B. Parazzone, made no mention of stopping at the movie theater en route to the bank. The theater manager said he saw her there. This discrepancy could be either a mistake of identity, a coincidence, or of great importance. I asked Mr. Crows if he would mind telling his story again. He agreed, and I took him upstairs to the 21st detective squad on the second floor. In my presence, he repeated the events as they occurred. Lieutenant King questioned him in great detail. When you saw her in the lobby, do you remember what kind of hat she had on? Well, it wasn't a hat exactly, Lieutenant. It was a bandana like a handkerchief over her head. It was raining. You know, lots of girls wear those things when it rains. And you couldn't see what color hair she had? No, but it was the same girl. Take my word for it. It was the same girl. Was she carrying anything in the theater? What do you mean? You mean a package or a pocketbook, anything like that? Yeah, yeah, she was carrying a pocketbook. Anything else? An umbrella. She had an umbrella. What kind of umbrella? What do you mean, what kind of umbrella? What color was it? What kind of handle did it have? Oh, well, I, I, I don't remember those things, Lieutenant. I didn't take that much notice of it. Uh, when you looked through the door at the building and you saw her standing there talking to me, Mr. Crows, did uh, she have the umbrella in her hand then? Well, I don't remember seeing it, Captain. Maybe she put it down someplace. I don't remember. She might have had it. Mm-hmm. All right, Mr. Crows, thanks a lot. Look, I don't know. Maybe I'm just shooting my mouth off. I don't even know what it all means. Probably just wasting your time and my time, too. What am I doing here? I should be over there thinking up ways to promote that stiff I've got opening on Monday. You're not wasting our time, Mr. Crows. We've got to consider every angle. Well, that's what I figured. Oh, thanks a lot, Mr. Crows. That's all right. Oh, uh, we'll keep an eye on that candy store. I'd appreciate that, Captain. Novak. Ben Novak. Yes, sir. Come in here a minute, William. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, what do you think, man? Oh, she could have had a good reason for stopping in the movie. If it was her. Yes, Lieutenant. Shut the door, William. On this robbery this afternoon, Ben, how close did you question the girl, the victim? Hello, Captain. Ben? Well, like I told you, she accounted for her time with a minute. Says she left the office about five minutes to two. She said she went down to the restaurant and had a sandwich. And then she went to the bank and started back to the office with the payroll. Did she say anything about any stops in between? No, sir. She couldn't have forgotten about making a stop someplace, could she? No, sir. I went over it with her three or four times. Hmm. She was pretty hazy on the description of the guy, wasn't she? Nothing definite. She said she was pretty scared. All she could see was the gun. How about the elevator boy? Well, I couldn't get much out of him. His English is pretty slim. Hernandez will be in at 6 o'clock. I'm going to see if I can get him to ride up there with me. 
man lives on 106th Street. Hernandez can talk to him in Spanish, and maybe we can find out something that way. Yeah, it's a good idea. How'd you leave it with this girl? Well, I told her we might want her to take a look through some mugs in the rogues gallery, see if she could pick out the man. Mm-hmm. When did you say you might do this? I said I might call her this afternoon. She said she'd be willing to ride downtown with me after she got finished work. Did you talk to her boss then? Uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. What did he say about her? He says she's been there about ten years. She's a good bookkeeper. He says she practically runs his business when he's away. Mm-hmm. She's uh, 36 years old. She lives with a married sister up in Washington Heights. Well, what's the deal, Lieutenant? What, what's this all about? She may not have told you a straight story about what happened after she left the office. No? Why don't you call her, Ben? Tell her you want her to take a look at some of the mugs. When, after she gets finished work? Now. Let me get it straight right now. I left the detective squad and walked downstairs through the back room where Patrolman Glass, the 124 man, was posting the latest teletype alarm. I saw Sergeant Waters come in the front door as I walked into the muster room. I called him aside and told him of an order that had come through assigning to the precinct a patrolman who had just been flopped after eight years in the 10th detective district. The man would be in Sergeant Waters' platoon. We conferred for a few minutes regarding the proper assignment for this man, whether he should be given a fixed post or made recorder in a second car. We looked over his departmental record and discussed the mental effect that emotion might have on the performance of his duties as a patrolman. It was decided to put him on post number three. Sergeant Waters went into the locker room to change to his uniform. Other men of the night tour were coming into the station house. I walked over to T.S. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Yes, sir, Captain. That's all right. Go ahead. Take the call. Who? Somebody's kidding you, mister. This is the 21st Precinct of the Police Department. All right. Yes, Captain. Get me division, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. No. Hold it a minute. I didn't know we were coming here. Just a second now, Miss. I've got to call up there. I thought we were going downtown. Look over some pictures. Uh, we are, yeah, but I've got to check something here first about the car. Sergeant, could you ring upstairs for me? Yeah, sure, Ben. Hello, Miss Carazoni. Oh, hello. Well, are you feeling better now? Oh, yes, a lot. Well, who do you want up there, Ben? The Lieutenant King. Is Lieutenant King there? This is Sergeant Klein on CS. Ben Novak wants to talk Does to him. Got any idea yet who that hold-up man was? Well, uh, the detectives are handling it now, Miss. Oh. Lieutenant King is on his way downstairs, Ben. Oh, good. Oh, here he comes now. I just called up for you, Lieutenant. Uh, yep. Hi, Captain. Hello, ma'am. Lieutenant, this is Miss Beatrice Parazzoni. She was the victim in that hold-up before. Oh, yes. How do you do, Miss Parazzoni? Hello. We're on our way downtown to look over some mugs to see if she can identify the man. Uh, how's the car? Is it tied up? I sent Whitey up to the 23rd to pick up a fellow that we're holding there. He'll be back in a minute. Can you wait? Have you got time, Miss Parazzoni? Well, yes, I guess so. How long do you think it'll take downtown to look at the pictures in it? Well, there's a lot of pictures, isn't there, Captain? Yeah. Well, plenty. Well, I'll call my sister. She's expecting me home for dinner. Oh, I think you'll be home for dinner, all right. Well, it's kind of early. Now, according to Detective Novak, you said you went downstairs about 2 o'clock or 5 minutes after. You went to a restaurant, had a sandwich for lunch, then went to the bank. You got the payroll and started back at the office. That's what she said she told you. Is that right, then? Yes, sir, that's what you said. Well, that's what I did, then. I just wanted to get it straight. How long has your boss been in business there, Miss Parazzoni? He started just before the war. Mm-hmm. Have you been with him all that time? Well, practically, Captain. I came in 1943. You live with your sister, is that right? Yes, that's right. Up Morrison Heights. She and her husband. And their boy. They have a boy six. How old are you? Thirty-six. You ever married? No. No, sir. What do you do when you're not working, Miss Parazzoni? Is that sort of a personal question? Well, maybe... I'm just a curious type. Nothing, nothing much. You have a boyfriend? I don't think I have to answer that, do I, Captain? Well, it's up to you. What well, do you want to know all about me for? I'm beginning to resent this. Well, when something like a robbery happens, he wants to know all about everything. Uh, do you have a boyfriend? No, no, sir. Uh, Captain, are you going to turn out the platoon? Yes, right now. They come marching right out here, Miss. Captain, can we wait in your office for a minute? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. All right. Come on this way, Miss Parazzoni. The van. Uh, yes, sir. We'll be for a few minutes. Platoon! Hey! Hey! Forward! Hey! You want to say anything to them, Captain? Yes. Report 
Second platoon. Platoon inspector, sir. Roll call. Uh-huh. Yes. Coley. Yes. Iceman. Yes. Zach. Yes. Sato. Yes. Nelson. Yes. As the roll was being called, I realized what course Lieutenant King was taking with the holdup victim, Beatrice Parazzoni. He wanted her brought into the station house, but without getting her unduly alarmed. Hence the excuse about the car and the interrogation in my office instead of upstairs in the detective squad. He had timed it perfectly. I spoke to the platoon and instructed the sector men and men on post to correct the condition which existed at the candy store near the new era theater and to watch for similar problems at other movie houses in the precinct. I read the alarm concerning the hold-up man wanted for the robbery in the precinct that afternoon. All right, Sergeant. Post the platoon. Sergeant? Yes. Matt? Oh, come in, Captain. I, uh, want to get at these reports here. That's all right. We're just talking. You're sure we're not disturbing you here, Captain? No, no. Go right ahead. Stan, do you want to check on the car? Yeah, okay, Lieutenant. Close the door, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, what else do you do in your spare time, Miss Farazzoni? Well, I read, and I sit with a baby when my sister and her husband go out, and I like to go to a concert once in a while. I like music. What else? Look at myself. Movies? Do you like movies? Sure, once in a while. When do you go? At nights? Yeah, at nights. I what? work in the daytime, except Saturday and Sunday. The movies are usually too crowded on Saturdays and Sundays. There's other things to do. You ever go in the daytime? No. Then why did you go today? What do you mean, today? Who said I went to the movies today? Did you? Well, yeah, for a little while. Now, wait a minute, just a second. I don't understand this. Just when did you go to the movies? When I left the office. You mean at 2 o'clock? Yes, that's right. You didn't say anything about that to anybody before? Well, I didn't think it was important. It's turning out to be important, isn't it? Yes. Then why didn't you think it was important before? I don't know. I just didn't think so, that's all. What was the name of the man you met there? Where? At the movies. I didn't meet any man. Supposing I told you you were seen with a man there. All right. I knew you'd find out. He said you wouldn't, but I knew you'd find out. Sure. We find out everything, don't we, Captain? Most of it. I didn't want to do it. I, I really didn't. I was afraid and... It wasn't right, and I didn't want to do it, but he said it wouldn't hurt my boss or me, only the insurance company. Nobody would find out about it. He was wrong, wasn't he? Yes, he was wrong. Why did you meet him in the theater? He wanted me to, to tell him how much was in the payroll. What's his name? Jack. Jack Curl. Oh, how you can get fooled. Sure can get fooled. He sounded so nice when I first met him. Where was that? On my vacation in the mountains. Where, at the hotel? Yes, that's right. I took my two weeks and I went away. I didn't expect to meet any man. All I wanted to do was get a little country air, a little fun time, that's all. But he was there and we danced and we went boarding and we home together. I, I didn't even go up there with any intention of meeting a man. Maybe I used to, but I got over that. It was really very nice. Very nice. And then when I came back to the city, he took my telephone number. I never expected to hear from him, really. But you did? Yes, he called, and we started to see each other in the city. You know, he'd come over, and we'd go to a movie, take a walk, something like that. How long ago was this? Well, I got back from my vacation three weeks ago. Then last Sunday night, we took a bus ride. It was so hot, we just had to get out someplace. We went up to Fort Tryon Park and we sat on a bench up there. I could see that he had something on his mind. I thought he was going to ask me to marry him. That's what I thought. I really thought that. And then he finally told me what it was. This? Yes, I... I was so surprised. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say a word. I, I didn't mean he was that kind of... Why he was so nice. Well, then why did you go ahead with it? Oh, I wasn't going to. I told him no. And then 
He said all he wanted the money for was just to get married. Is that why you did it, so he'd marry you? No, I don't think I would have married him. I, I just did it because he wanted the money so bad. That's why I wouldn't have married him ever, believe me. Weren't you still afraid, Bing? Yes. Well, then why did you go through with it? Oh, I don't know. I guess because he was so nice to me. At least for a month, I had a good time. I figured I owed him something, that's all. Where does he live? I don't know. He never would tell me. Some hotel, I think. Is Jack Curley his real name? I don't know. I think so. Where can we find him? Well, he was supposed to meet me tonight. Where? In a bar on Broadway, way uptown, 830. Oh, I got to thinking. I think that all he wanted was the money from this. I think he made the date just so I'd go through with this today. I don't think he's going to show up. I don't think I'll ever see him again. You'll see him again. Maybe not tonight, but I guarantee you'll see him again. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Klein. Who's dead? Who? She was killed. Ah. Where is it? Where? Eighty eight East what? He's 70. Who is this calling? What's your name? Doris Watt. All right. Just stay right where you are. The officers will be there right away. Yeah, right away. Oh, don't worry and about so it. Take care of it. Around the clock, through the week, yeah. every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan, in the role of Captain Canelli, Ken Lynch is Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Eric, Mandel Kramer, Wendell Holmes, Bill Smith, and Lawson Zerbe. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking.